IndyCar wasn't allowing very many credentials to, to be released to the media. Uh, and Paul Fanner, the owner of Racer, wanted to do something a little different. So he came up with the idea of doing these almost, I almost say like jury room illustrations. So I had my markers at the ready and I made, I pre-made uh, four illustrations with just generic Indy cars and left the liveries off and waited for the phone call from Lawrence Foster. Um, this particular illustration is the checkered flag with Scott Dixon crossing the finish line. And um, the initial composition was created, I think it was late Friday night. So mostly it was just the black details and the, the Texas um, wall. So as soon as the race was over, I gave myself a 15 minute window to, to uh, put Scott Dixon's livery on the car and kind of reround the finish a few times to see how the lighting effects were going off. Uh, and you know just how they worked with an empty grandstand. It was a surreal thing to see on television and a surreal thing to draw as well. Paul, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you today. I have so many questions and frustrations as an artist and a lot of those answers kind of just end up in the air and I feel so alone. And when I hang out with someone that is so established and successful and that has such a long legacy and you know in your career it kind of makes me feel like i'm not alone you know because you're so open and you're so willing to share your journey so i just want to say thank you for that and you know, my first question this might not even have anything to do with the show but um i'd like to ask you what is your definition of an artist it's I think it's a wide scope of different talents, whether it's acting, um, dance, music. Uh, I think it, my definition of an artist is someone who's confident enough to express themselves in whatever uh, discipline that's in their heart. And, and you know, to, to, to echo off of that, what is, how did you build your confidence to be able to express yourself? as an artist. I mean, that, that sounds like one has to have that confidence and that, that, uh, that conviction, if you will, right? I think it might be. I just ignored everything around me. As a child, uh, I think I gravitated more to my crayons and paper than I did a toy. Uh, that was my outlet. Um, you know, I would see a football player on TV and a few minutes later I would just stop watching the game and draw a picture of a football player. Um, so it was just built in me just ignoring everything around and my son came to me at a really young age. He said, Dad, you know what? I can see something in my head and put it on paper and not everybody can do that. And I was pretty much the same way. It was, it just blew me away, but um, it was just something I had inborn and I just, um, you know, ignored everybody around me. I didn't, I don't think I had any doubters. Wow. It's amazing. So you were born with this need to express, huh? Yeah. yeah. It just, yeah, just came naturally. And did the confidence build naturally or did that come in time? You think? There is no confidence at any time. Uh, I think I'm always challenging myself. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's certain points in a in a piece where I don't feel like I'm going to get it completed in the way that I want to. So, I think it's just built in to have a doubt, and I just fight my way through That's it. That's healthy to have doubt. As I suppose so. I yeah. I I suppose so. So when did you start drawing cars or like, you know, how did you, when did you start applying the, the, the love affair for the cars to your art? When did that happen? My parents came back from a trip from Europe when I was maybe eight. And my brothers and I, we all uh, had model cars that were pretty impressive. They weren't like little Hot Wheels. I remember my brother's car was a Ferrari Formula One car. It was the same car that was racing in the Monaco Grand Prix on television. And that excited me that my brother had that car and I would draw 
pictures of his car and just make them up in my head. Um, and then across the street, I had a neighbor who was a Baja racer and his garage, I was friends with his son and his garage was filled with pictures of Mark Donahue and Porsches. And so uh, I just kind of gravitated to his house all the time to look at those cars. And At one time, an artist could put their art on a cover. You would get, you know, you would get graced with your work on a cover. And after you start collecting it month after month, there's a record of your history. There's a legacy and you can touch it. But today, everything is going into digital. Even media has become digital. Do you feel like your work is less valuable once it's digital and not on like a magazine cover? No, I don't think so. And uh, I've worked in the digital medium since 1995 with an old software program, Aldous Freehand. I now work in Adobe Illustrator. And uh, I keep that old computer because you can't open those files any other way except for this old computer and this old software and I have to convert them into an EPS. I, I'll open up one of those CDs uh, and once in a while I'll look at an illustration I did and I can't remember doing it because I did it so quickly, you know, because I've, I've worked uh, for magazines in the publishing uh, print industry uh, since 1990. And a lot of times you're working under pressure where an editor needs something now. Um, so it's here and gone and you've forgotten about it, but there's a digital record of it. I don't have a print of it. Right. Um, so the digital world is just, you know, it's been part of my life forever. Decades. So you st you have equity, or there's value in digital in the digital space for you, right? Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so do you feel confident that this NFT kind of wave is going to last? I do. I think it's the next evolution for the medium. I, uh, you know, like I talked about, there's a stack of CDs that no one is enjoying, sitting in my garage with probably some beautiful artwork I haven't even looked at in 20 years. Right. Sometimes it's like sand slipping in my hand, right? I go, yeah, how do, how is this going to last? You know? I almost look at the medium as one that is so open right now. There's so much room for error. You can invest a lot of time and make a mistake and, and tweak it because it's digital. There's this concern about the NFT world of people copying your work and duplicating it and selling it, right? Exploiting it. I mean, how do you feel that? How do you feel about that, that potential that could happen? I think that it's always existed and it's always going to be a paranoia for anyone, whether it's a music sample. Um, it's nothing I can stop. I, you know, it happens uh, within the world of photography as well. Um, it's an inevitability. It, I, I can't look at it as something that's going to hinder what I do. I just have to accept it. It's there. Well, Paul, I'd like to talk about some of your covers in uh, Racer Magazine. You shared with me earlier on how you came up with the design. You know, could you kind of go through the whole origin of this particular design? Because I love the, the different colors. So there's a method to the madness behind this, oh, right? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, the Racer covers uh, are a collaboration with Lawrence Foster, the editor-in-chief. Um, the ideas always start from him. I have to define what he's looking for. And I was excited about this particular cover because it depicts the Mazda that won in 1991. And I had been to Le Mans the previous year in 1990. Um, and it was, it was exciting to see that car because that exact car raced in 19, 1990, but it didn't win. And uh, talking with Lawrence, I knew I kind of tweaked his ear a little bit where I had mentioned the sunset at Le Mans and the sky changes so many different colors. So I quickly th threw uh, Illustrator file together to show him this very bold orange section and a very bold green section with a Dunlop bridge. And um, what I love about Lawrence is when he sees I have you know, a passion for a certain subject matter that, you know, he just lets me run with it. 
I think it's one of my favorite covers just because he was able to let me like exercise out that idea that I had in my head. You know, it sounds like to me that you love the concept of collaboration within your art because you keep talking about Lawrence and his input. You know, some people are like, no, I don't, I don't it's, it's my way or the highway. I mean, have you always been like that? Do you feel like collaboration is important for good art? You know what, uh, that's a interesting question. I think uh, it depends on the personalities and uh, I need to have my input. And, and I, I, I see that and I know that He's probably the same way with the other artists that we work with. There's a artist we work with, Doug Garrison, who does very abstract work, very opposite of what my style is. I have a feeling Lawrence is just as open with him and a collaboration. So I think it, it depends on the person you're working with. And he's one of those type of people that- Easy to work with. Easy to work easy with. Easy to collaborate with. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Paul. This was really insightful. This was fun. Yeah. It was really fun. Yeah.